Hi guys, this is Misty Reed and this is my presentation, What Your BBTs Are Trained to Tell You. I get a lot of questions from patients regarding why they should bother taking their BBTs, so I'm hoping that this presentation will give you some information as to why you should go ahead and consider taking them and help motivate you to do so as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So what are BBTs? BBT stands for basal body temperature and it literally is the baseline temperature that your body is working from, meaning that you take this temperature as soon as you wake up in the morning before you set up start talking, get out of bed, do anything. You take this temperature and then after you get up and go about your day, your temperature actually starts to rise afterwards. And I have patients take their temperatures when I'm working with them because it really helps us gather information about your reproductive health and therefore about your fertility, right? So any extra information that we can gather um, can help me with my diagnosis in the, in the, initially as well as help my patients make progress quicker and make progress in the right direction as well. So let's talk a little bit about what information we can get from that. So first of all, this is what they should look like. So your BBT chart ideally should look something like this if we had a normal 28 day cycle. Now, cycle day one is the first day of your period, right? So the first day, full day of flow, not first day of spotting, but first full day of flow. And so when you're bleeding, that's an inflammatory process. And so the body may go ahead and have those temperatures be a little bit higher. So the, for the first few days of your period, temperatures can be from about 97 to 98. I'm not too particular about that until about the third or fourth day when I want them down the low 97s. 97.2 to 97.4 is perfect. And then usually around cycle day 14, we'll see a drop in temperatures. Now this indicates that luteinizing hormone has reached its peak. This causes a cascade of other events by the pituitary gland, resulting in ovulation. So when we see this drop, and this drop should be about half a degree to a full degree below what your temperature was averaging in the first half of your cycle. So normally, you know, in, in the mid to high 96s is ideal. Um, and then when we see this drop, you should be ovulating within 12 to 36 hours. So either that day or the following day is what we'll notice. What happens is when we ovulate, the follicle that was prepping the egg for the, that whole cycle, right, went ahead and released it. And the egg goes down the fallopian tube, hopefully has a nice date with the sperm, right? That's, what, that's where they should meet is in the fallopian tube. But what's left behind becomes the corpus luteum. So the follicle that released the egg actually changes from a follicle at that point to a corpus luteum. And that little guy is very important. It's actually responsible for making progesterone, not only during the second half of our cycle, but until about the 10th week of pregnancy if we do conceive. So it's very important. So what happens is these temperatures drop, we ovulate, and as they start going up, it inflames that sac, that corpus luteum, to make progesterone. And that progesterone in turn is very warming and helps these temperatures continue to raise. So that hopefully about three or four days after we see that drop, I like to see them in the low 98s, 98.2 is perfect. And then usually around cycle day 28, if a woman's pregnant, temperatures actually keep going up to about 99 degrees. If she's not pregnant or if she miscarries, temperatures start going down and the whole cycle starts over again, right? So let's talk a little bit about the different ways um, that these temperatures may not look like this. So one thing that can happen is maybe these temperatures are a little low, I'm sorry, a little high in the follicular phase. And the follicular phase is the first half of our cycle. So if these temperatures are high, they would resemble more what is you know what looks like the green line on this chart. The blue line is what's ideal. The green line is a little high though in that first half of the cycle. So over the years, um, you know, as a reproductive acupuncturist, which is where I first, you know, received most of my fertility training was as a reproductive acupuncturist, we were trained to notice patterns between things. And we noticed different patterns with how the temperatures look, with what our patients were experiencing with fertility, as well as with their labs, and some other things that might be going on with them holistically. When temperatures are high in the follicular phase, um, we've noticed a correlation with decrease in egg quality. Particularly, the eggs seem to be a little bit more brittle. Um, what we've noticed is that patients, for example, that would go through an IVF cycle, if their temperatures were high before they started prepping for an IVF cycle, uh, their eggs were actually brittle and wouldn't usually fertilize, even if they did ICSI, which is where they take the sperm and insert it into the egg. Um, so even in those cases, sometimes they couldn't fertilize because the eggs were too brittle. So that's one thing that we would notice. Um, um, another thing we notice is whenever these temperatures are high, I see a correlation with abnormal AMH, FSH, and estradiol. Specifically, usually FSH and estradiol are high, meaning that when those patients go get their cycle day three labs run, their cycle day three labs look a little off. In conjunction with that, AMH usually tends to be low, is what we find. Um, so that's what we see if those temperatures in the follicular phase tend to be a little bit high. 
Something else we might see is low luteal phase temps. So the luteal phase is the second half of your cycle, so day 15 through 28. Um, and what happens here is this is a good indication of progesterone levels, right? So if we're seeing these temperatures below, which would be represented by the green line on this chart, we certainly see an insufficient progesterone levels in those patients when they have blood work done seven days post ovulation to look at progesterone levels. Now something else we've noticed in the clinic that I worked at over time was as these temperatures were too low and it indicated insufficient progesterone levels, we also saw a correlation with unsuccessful pregnancies, meaning if temperatures were above 98 degrees and the month prior to conception, so they went through this whole cycle, they weren't pregnant, get their period, and they go through the next cycle and conceive on the following cycle, right? So in that full month prior, when we actually could look at the progesterone levels before they conceived, if temperatures were above 98, um, we would see a higher correlation with those patients not only to get pregnant, but also to stay pregnant. Um, and the last year for that, at the clinic that I worked at, where they ran those stats was in 2007, and what they noticed was if temperatures were above 98, only 4% of those patients miscarried. If temperatures were in the 97s after ovulation, 40% of those patients miscarried. Um, so it certainly doesn't mean that if we can't get a patient's temperatures up above 98 after ovulation that they're going to miscarry, not be able to carry to full term. You know, 60% of those patients did carry to term and have a healthy live birth. It just means that if we can get your temperatures higher, we know we can go ahead and have a, a more positive impact. Um, in terms of not only getting pregnant, but staying pregnant as well. And that's just a clinical observation that we've noticed in the clinic that I've worked at. Something else we might see with temperatures is that they might be up and down. Um, and so this is represented by this green line on this particular chart. So sometimes I'll meet with a new patient and they're like, oh, a temperature charting, yeah, I did that. Um, but my temperatures were all over the place. It didn't really mean anything, so I just stopped taking them. So there can be a couple different things going on here. Um, you know, when temperatures are up and down like this, we usually see a correlation with those patients going through a lot of stress. And whenever you're really stressed, you also have high cortisol levels. That also means that the liver is not metabolizing hormones very well, right? So estrogen, FSH, progesterone, all those things are kind of varying because the liver is not doing a good job of metabolizing those hormones into a usable or excretable form. Um, so that's one thing to be going on. Another thing that could be going on is these patients might be not, they might not be sleeping very well, or maybe they're eating the wrong foods in the first half of their cycle or the second half. So there could be a couple of different things going on, but usually um, if temperatures look like this, there's a lot of stress on, uh, for the patient, um, and there's also probably poor sleep habits as well. So that's something that we'll see as those temperatures going up and down. Another thing that we might see is low temperatures throughout the whole month, though, not just after ovulation. So what you'll see with the green line here is it looks normal, but then when you look at the temperatures, you'll notice that they're all low for the whole month, right? Those temperatures in the first half are in the 96s, and after ovulation, they're still in the 97s. Uh, but when you look at how much of a difference in temperature there is, they look pretty good, right? They, they look pretty normal. Um, but what we notice with these temperatures when they're low for the whole month, we see a correlation with insufficient thyroid function. So specifically, usually hypothyroid, um, and more specifically than that, a lot of Hashimoto's patients actually, their temperatures will look like this. Um, so, so I see that correlation a lot. Something else I notice with these patients is of course they just have a big hormonal imbalance usually. Um, if their temperatures are off like this, thyroid's off, and that means you know, other sex hormones are going to be off as well. So, so just to review um, what BBTs mean. So they can indicate hormonal balance or imbalance. They give us a lot of information as to what your hormone levels are looking like, um, whether it be the, in the first half of the cycle, second half of the cycle. Um, something else that we can go ahead and get information about from your temperatures is stress levels, right? When they're really up and down like that, they can really be an indication to me as a practitioner that the patient's really stressed out. And then another thing that we can sometimes get some insight into is thyroid function. So this can be especially helpful if a patient hasn't yet realized that they have a thyroid issue, maybe it's gone undiagnosed clinically, or maybe they recently have been diagnosed with a thyroid issue, they're on new medication. Um, it's really nice for us to be able to have them do temperature charting so I can see how their thyroid function is improving over time. And that's just a few things that we can kind of gather from temperature charting. So um, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please share it with others. I always love to help people as much as I can, especially with their fertility journey. Um, if you'd like other hints and tips and just interesting fertility articles and 
inspiring stories as well. You can follow me on Facebook um, as well as on Twitter. And if you've gone ahead and been following me for a while and you're ready to learn more about what your body is telling you regarding your fertility um, and you want to go ahead and take a little bit more control of your health, please contact me. I'd love to do a free 45-minute consult to go ahead and explore with you how I can help you reach your fertility goals and you know the goals of growing your family. And if you have any other questions about this slide or anything else that you've seen on my blog or Facebook, anything like that, please don't hesitate to contact me. I love reaching out to people and helping with whatever I can. Um, and I hope this video finds you well. And until next time, don't stop dreaming. Take care and have a great day, guys.